Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. Before we get into the case that we're talking about tonight, we always want to remind you of what's in our description and show notes. Every week, you will find links to our resources that we use to research if you want to do a little bit more reading or check up some of the articles on the cases that we cover. We also have links to resources for things like 12-step, domestic violence support, anti-bullying, suicide hotlines, etc., We also put links in for our social media, so we definitely would love it if you followed us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We've got a ton of breaking news, true crime memes, information about when new episodes are coming out, so definitely check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to get merch, we are on Threadless, so check out Threadless for some mugs, shirts, tote bags, a whole bunch of stuff like that. And if you want to have access to ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and a bunch of bonus content, then check out our Patreon on patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast. We want to say thank you to the new people on our Patreon this week. So thank you to Haley, Lana, Casey, Jess, Celeste, Shell, and Aloha La Candy, aka Candice. So thanks, you guys. Thank you. We love you and we appreciate you so much. Very, very, very much. Thank you. So that's pretty much it for me. We can jump into our next railroad for letter R, murderer. These people are all over the place in every (laughs) sense of the term. Yes. A lot of the railroad killers are kind of all over the place scattered in terms of their mental state and also just physically all over across the U.S. just going back and forth. You never know where they are. And so that's definitely a commonality that the railroad killers have is they're really hard to find. Even if police know that this is their prime suspect, it's almost impossible to narrow down where they are, to get them into custody, to get them in for even an interview, you know? It's definitely something that we see over and over again in the railroad murders. And then let's say that they do find him, right? The time that has gone by and the miles that they've put between themselves and the crime are all washed away. It's it's gone. So there's nothing to even... You know, hey, we heard you were in town. Somebody saw a drifter that looked like you. What do you have to say about it? Well, I was on a train. It's like, how do you argue with that? So it's really (laughs) hard to pin these guys down even when they are the only main suspect in a murder. Nobody has ever been considered. Even 20, 30 years later, they're the only ones still. But there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, if I ever need an alibi for anything, like, you know, I shoplift some chapstick or something and I need an alibi, I'll just tell someone that I'm on a train. Uh, Yeah, at at the time of the theft, I was on a train because they can't really prove anything. (laughs) We keep seeing that in these cases like, oh, you say you're on a train. It's like nobody knows where you are. (laughs) Well, he said he was on a train. We're going to trust him. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Wild. (laughs) Yeah. So tonight we are talking about William Guatney, who was born February 14th, Valentine's Day, which is coming up, 1922. And he was adopted by the Guatney family as a very small baby. His family and friends often called him Junior, or they shortened his name to Bill. He had siblings, including one older brother who were biological children of his parents. So as far as I could tell, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, he was the only one that was adopted. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. That is correct. During his childhood, the family lived in Fredonia, Kansas, but later he would say he was raised in Neosho Falls, Kansas, which is really just less than an hour away. 
At 14, he ran away from his parents' home, which is another thing we see as a commonality in these railroad killer murders. They definitely have early childhood or early teen tween year difficulty where they run away. And it kind of starts them on the path of being out on the street, being transient, and looking for ways to get around and leads them to the railroad. Yes, that is very accurate. He lived with his grandparent at some point and also with his brother and his sister-in-law, Pearl, when he was a teenager. His late teens was when William began, quote, riding the rails of the many freight trains that traveled through the Midwest. We can, of course, speculate that him running around and getting on the trains had to do with him running away and moving in with just different family members at different times, even though he's still a teen. I'm sure it's also the excitement of being alone and on the train and you know, I get on the train, I don't know where it's going, but I'm going to end up somewhere. You know, it's it's very exciting for a teenager, I'm sure. Especially one who seems a little angsty to begin with and is already trying to run away and put some miles between himself and home. Yeah, he's really wanting to get out there in the world. And I think it represents a sense of adventure and getting away from whatever home life that he was running away from. It doesn't really sound like we know of anything horrific going on, but there was some sort of turmoil since he was bounced around so much. So he wanted to be on his own without having to answer to the adults. I think you nailed it with the adventure angle of it. It's kind of how it starts. I believe so. Yeah, it just makes a lot of sense. So he began living in boxcars, traveling from town to town, and just crisscrossing the country back and forth again and again. In 1942, at 20 years old, he joined the Army, and he ended up being shipped off to serve in the Army Tank Division while fighting in World War II. During his service, William was actually hit by shrapnel in the head, and he had to be hospitalized for about a year. That's that's super severe. It's a long time. He absolutely has traumatic brain injury from this point forward. No matter what, he's got TBI on board, walking around, helping him make decisions. Right. We yeah. have to think that that is completely affecting his cognitive function. It's affecting his emotions. It's affecting the way that his brain works. It's just never going to be the same after something like this, especially at this time period. Yes. And at this point, we're still lobotomizing people too. So we don't have a great understanding of psychology or even just the physical science of the brain at this time. So, you know, oh, he hit his head. They put him in the hospital. He's going to recover. And he snaps back, right? Like, but again, he's had this traumatic brain injury. So even if he recovers, things are not going to be the same. Right. We just didn't have the technology at the time to understand yes. what was going on inside his brain. It's kind of like, oh, the wound is healed. So he's yes. good. Send him out into the streets, you know, with yep. no sort of rehab or, you know, follow up therapy or anything like that. The injury was so severe that for nine months of his hospitalization, he had to be fed through a tube. Eventually, he was given a certified disabled discharge from a veteran's hospital in Boise, Idaho. Of course, since it was the 40s and both medicine and technology were not as advanced as today, the doctors did not have a lot of, let's say, detailed information about the long-term effects of the injury on his brain. And therefore, of course, they can't pass on that information to him about, you know, what he should be looking out for, how to do follow-up care, anything like that. And, you know, one of the things that stood out to me is to kind of look up when our brain technology kind of developed. So x-rays didn't even exist until 1895, which is, of course, before this, but that's x-rays. 
CT scans were invented in 1967, and MRIs didn't exist until 1977. So the information that they have about the severity of his injury, what area of the brain is affected, how to properly treat it, how to do rehab and aftercare, none of that existed at this time. It's crazy that he is still like 20 years out from even a CT scan. Right, exactly. Like all you can do is an x-ray and see if maybe the skull has a fracture I know it's a little bit of extra information, but it just is interesting to me. What they had at their disposal to use and give him information was next to nothing. You can see a crack in the skull and that's where it ends. Also, because the information was not available, there was a just complete lack of aftercare or compassion and accommodation for someone who had a traumatic brain injury at this time. So people just kind of didn't know there was no awareness. When you see someone and you assume that they're just going to act a certain way, and if they don't fit into that box, you don't know that it's because they got hit by shrapnel and had to be hospitalized for a year. Today, someone could say, oh, just bear with me, you know, my memory's bad, or this is challenging for me because I have a traumatic brain injury. But because they didn't treat it that way at that time, he can't really get his own accommodations and get compassion from people. It is safe to assume that William didn't get the necessary rehabilitation, and this made his continued challenges much more severe and difficult to recover from. In 1947, he was diagnosed with organic brain syndrome, with symptoms that include memory lapses, confusion, paranoid schizophrenia, and a low IQ. And that's an issue that's with the actual brain itself. We have issues like, for example, you know, um, anxiety isn't a physical man. It's like, you know, it's not something with the actual physical brain itself. What? Do you get what I'm saying? I'm confused. I'm sorry. I wish I knew more. He has problems with his actual brain. The organ is not working well. Therefore, the things that are happening are due to the fact that his brain is sick. He's right. not. Ex- he might be exhibiting depression and anxiety and things, but these are very different from somebody whose actual organ, the brain, he has, you know, like the liver is sick. You have cirrhosis of the liver. This is an actual disorder, a disease of his brain. Does I hear what sense? you're saying. Okay. So thank like, you. for example, I mean, anxiety would be response to external stimuli. You thank know, you. like you get anxious about a situation that you're in, whereas having organic brain syndrome means that your brain itself is not really functioning in the way that a normal brain would function. Thank you, Brianna. You are a translator <laughs> and a scholar. <laughs> That's it right there. You're exactly the anxiety is a response from something. The organic brain syndrome. This is not a response. This is just the organ itself is diseased. Right. Which is a crazy diagnosis for somebody not to be put into a facility, especially at this time, because that's what they do with people with mental disorders at this time. Yeah, definitely back in this era, it was just, oh, if you have something going on that you're a little bit different, we're going to categorize you as basically broken and we're going to put you far away from society. You know, we're going to isolate you. It was just extremely common. So I'm surprised that he wasn't put in some sort of care with what he was challenged with. Once he was out of the hospital, he went right back to riding the rails across the country once again. His friends gave him the nickname Freight Train because one of his special talents was mimicking train whistle sounds with his mouth. Sometimes when the train would stop, he'd venture into the nearest small town or walk around exploring the areas surrounding the train depot. There were these certain towns that were clearly his favorite since he seemed to hang around more often than others, 
and even often enough to become known within those communities as kind of just this general harmless drifter character that everybody knew. People who interacted with William described him as, quote, a hobo who was happy-go-lucky. Other casual acquaintances said, quote, he always was polite and seemed to love children. Interesting description. He hated being called a bum or a tramp. And hearing those words were the few times that people recall actually seeing him get very angry. Joan Schmidt of Springfield, Illinois, developed a good enough rapport with William to let him stay in her garage when he was in town. She said, quote, All I can say is that my children really loved him. He didn't like the kids who taunted him with names. By his own admission, he struggled with anger issues, and he had told a friend, quote, I'm two people. I can also be mean. But the kids love him. I don't know. There was just a little snap inside him. Like, it just didn't take much to set him off, and there were certain buttons that people would push. And as a person that was living on the road and living kind of a rough life, people would see him and call him names, taunt him, and generally just be shitty to him, and he would lash out. And I'm not saying that's okay at all, but that just seemed to be his trigger. It's also a symptom of a traumatic brain injury, is like irrational lashing out, like anger issues and stuff like that too. Could be completely unrelated, but... He has been hit in the head with shrapnel and was in the hospital for a year. Sometimes the emotions sway back and forth between moods very quickly when you have a traumatic brain injury, you know, and it's hard to control that. A friend from a random town recalled, quote, he was a strong man when he got mad. So clearly there was some physical violence. Even if we don't have necessarily a police record there, there were some people that knew if you crossed him, it sounds like you were going to get your ass kicked, right? Yeah, definitely. The instability and emotional swings were also exacerbated by William's love of wine and excessive alcohol consumption. Just never, any substances never really help a brain issue, a mood disorder, a mental health challenge, anything like that. It's just putting extra stuff in your body is just not going to help, you know? Yeah, not this one. Sometimes he would take trains that ran through his hometown, so he would visit his childhood friends and his remaining siblings. According to his sister-in-law, Pearl, he, quote, liked children and would take them fishing when he came home. He was a pretty good fisherman. A town council member's wife said, quote, he never bothered anybody. He just didn't stay in one place too long. I never heard he was violent or hurt anybody. He was more or less just thrown around. Again and again, it just seems a little strange that people always bring up that he was so good with children. Repeatedly, like over and over again. And I don't think I even necessarily included them all. I I think I probably did. What are we talking about? But it was just striking. You don't want to say it, but... (laughs) I mean, there's, you know, a pattern. And quite frankly, my high school principal, you could say, oh, he loved children, right? He works with the youth, though. He's not a freight train guatney making train whistle noises with his mouth, (laughs) going from town to town, living with the boxcar children, which exists, we found out, by the way, this past week in the Facebook group. But anyway, he's also a good fisherman. It's like the priorities here are just a little strange. The things that they point out again and again are weird. And then, oh, yeah, he gets mad and he's strong. What? 
<laughs> it, it, they just go all over the place with this guy. I don't know. I'm really good with kids. I, you know, I'm very friendly <laughs> with with all my friends' children and my niece and nephew. And but I never think that if someone was like, "How would you describe Brianna?" That She's the first so thing someone would children. say, <laughs> right? It wouldn't happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's so many other aspects of my personality. And you can say that about anyone. I can't think of one person that the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, that person's really good with children. And Especially if you say something him. like that, yeah, if you say something like that about a person, I feel like it's a red flag. I don't know. Am I crazy? It's just I can't think of one person. It's not crazy because you've, you've taken all the pieces and put them together. And so when you hear the first sentence, it's like, you know, um, oh, what did you think? He liked children. It's like they say it first to get it out of the way. It, it's weird. <laughs> Every time they say it just like, oh, he liked kids. He liked kids. And he liked to fish, too. He was, you know, it, it's he like... He can make train whistle noises secondary to liking children. And that was another thing <laughs> they said was, well, the kids loved it when he would make the train whistles with his mouth. And every goddamn thing they talk about, they bring it back to the kids. And normally that wouldn't be weird. But again, we are talking about a man who is an adult grown up man with no children, who is on the move, who is a transient, drunk hobo <laughs> going from town to town. He's not a teacher. He's not a high school coach. You know, he's not somebody that is working with the youth. He is making it a point to be away from people. Right. So why the hell are we always putting him with kids? Yeah. It's anyway. it's just very interesting. And like I said, I can't think of anyone that I would say that about. It's something that you would want to say about, let's say, your child's preschool teacher. Like, oh, exactly. she's just so great with the kids and she's just made to do this job and this is her life's passion. But anybody else, if it's the first thing you think of, I think there's something wrong with that. I think that's a red flag. And this is definitely concerning. I agree. So William would sometimes just get off the train while he was traveling and then stay somewhere and pick up odd jobs or temporary employment so he could just set roots in that town for just a little bit of time. Usually he secured jobs working as a herdsman or working at traveling state and county fairs or livestock shows. Basically a carny. Well, I was we about just... to say, I wonder if he ever ran into Leanne Locken's mom on the Carney circuit from Housewives <laughs> of Dallas, the well-known past she's got. You know, she ran three games herself by the time she was 12. <laughs> anyway. They probably knew each other. Total side note. But yeah, no, I mean, the whole that whole world is just the people and the interviews you get from that circuit. Always worth it. Yeah. And it's filled with just interesting people that are constantly traveling and seeing the U.S. just from a different kind of lens, you know? A lot of storytellers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once the job was over, or basically he just didn't want to work anymore, he was back on the road, always on the move on the rail cars. It was really clear that he wasn't very comfortable staying in one place for that long, even when it was possible for him to set down roots and get something settled. He didn't really want that. With Metro by T-Mobile, your hard-earned money goes further. This tax season, there's zero fees to switch. Enjoy Metro's lowest price. Just 25 bucks a line for four lines. Plus, get four free Samsung Galaxy phones when you switch. Now that's the best deal in wireless. Metro by T-Mobile. Empowering you to rule your day. All lines lose promo rate if any deactivates. No fees on select phones. Limit one per line with eligible port. Excludes sales tax. Limited time offer. Additional terms apply. See Metro by T-Mobile.com. With Metro by T-Mobile, your hard-earned money goes further. 
This tax season, there's zero fees to switch. Enjoy Metro's lowest price. Just 25 bucks a line for four lines. Plus, get four free Samsung Galaxy phones when you switch. Now that's the best deal in wireless. Metro by T-Mobile. Empowering you to rule your day. All lines lose promo rate if any deactivates. No fees on select phones. Limit one per line with eligible port. Excludes sales tax. Limited time offer. Additional terms apply. See Metro by T-Mobile.com. William spent a lot of time with young boys in these towns. And of course, there were rumors of his questionable behavior that seemed to always be just one step behind him and definitely could be part of the reason why he was moving around so much. So as soon as there was some rumors that popped up and people were talking about all these boys or teenagers he was hanging out with, then he would move on to the next town. Yes. At this time, there was even more secrecy and shame surrounding sexual abuse. People just would not talk about it. So even though there were some whispers and rumors, nobody was really coming forward to make direct accusations or go to the police to press charges or anything like that. It was just this little whispers in the background. People kind of had this knowledge that, oh, this is William's thing, we think this about William, but nothing was really done about it. And it certainly wasn't out in the open. No, I think that's exactly what happened, is he was just always, like, a step ahead. Yeah. Because of this, in the same breath, people would describe him as harmless in the way that he, quote, loved children, but also concern for the way he, quote, loved children. Yeah. From people's comments about William, which were always and only related to young boys, it was clear that he was only preying on boys and really had no interest in girls and wouldn't interact with girls at all. On March 2nd, 1974, William showed up at Marion, Illinois VA Hospital with a severe concussion and cuts on his face. That's all the information about his admission, too. Interesting. His injuries were severe enough to keep him in the hospital for almost a month. And then he was released on March 27th, 1974. The specifics of how he got those injuries were unclear. But it really seems that he must have gotten into some sort of altercation or possibly, you know, one of my speculations is he could have attacked someone that was strong enough to fight back. Yeah, something. But something happened there and it seemed like they were wounds from a fight. So you've got to wonder if a teenager was involved or something like that. Yeah. One of the reasons we can speculate that he got injured while attacking someone is because we know that the following year, he committed his first murder. On August 30th, 1975, best friends, 13-year-old John Simpson and 12-year-old Jacob Serber went to the Nebraska State Fair in Lincoln. And this was really a perfectly normal type of outing for the friends, and it seemed like any other day until later on when neither of the boys returned home after the fair. Jacob's body was found on September 8th, nine days after his disappearance. He was found lying in the Antelope Creek drainage ditch about one block from the fairgrounds, and he had been stabbed to death. On September 22nd, John's decomposing body was found inside a railroad hopper car, and he also had multiple stab wounds. That particular rail car had been parked at the fairgrounds from August 29th to September 3rd, until it was moved to a grain mill where the body was discovered inside. So bizarre that he just sat there in this, sorry, he just was like in this railroad car 
And it wasn't until, you know, the train moves through, whatever it is, we got to move some grain. They're moving cars around and then they just find this kid that they've been looking for. And it's like yeah. two weeks after they found the other one. And, it, you know, these boys just disappeared off the face of the earth from this fair. And he was just there the whole time yeah. inside this car. Police began an extensive investigation and interviewed hundreds of people before honing in on seven, quote, likely suspects. All of the suspects were males between 19 and their late 30s, some of which were carnival workers who were at the fair that day. We have seen this a few times now, by the way, in our railroad killer research. How many of these carnival workers were either suspected or convicted of sexual crimes, murders that, you know, almost always have a sexual assault element to them related to carnival workers simply because of it's always moving through town. Anytime that you're traveling, anytime that you're on the move, it just makes it so much easier to get away with murder and for them to not be able to track you. Yeah. Nobody knows where you're going, where you came from. Detectives can't track you down. So it's a really, I don't want to say great job, but it, it just makes sense. It's a sense. great job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it makes sense for someone who wants to live a life of crime to go to a job that is just constantly on the move. That's why we see railroad killers, we see truck drivers and hikers, carnies. And of course, like we always say, just because you fit into these categories does not mean you are a violent offender or murderer. Of course, there's plenty of people that choose these careers that are not. But when you do choose something that involves so much traveling, it just makes it more common to get away with it or to be on the run for longer because it's hard to catch you. Yes. So one of the seven main suspects actually confessed to an officer that he may have killed the boys but wasn't certain because he couldn't remember doing it. It's an interesting problem to have. Right? Yes. I, I mean, what was going on? That, I don't is know. Is it another person with a traumatic brain injury or is it a person in who's a blackout drunk? I, I mean, I think, we just don't know. I think know. blackout drunk. I think a blackout drunk. That was the first. That was my first guess. Yeah. But the thing is, even though he confessed and said he didn't know what he had done that night, the police cleared him quickly and they informed him that he'd actually been in prison at the time that the murders were committed. Well, there's twofold here. The first is <laughs> you're very relieved because you're like, oh, thank God I didn't commit that murder. But then there's also this aspect where you're kind of probably sad because if you went to the police and you're like, hey, I might have done this, you feel really, really bad and you have like a heavy heart, guilty conscience kind of thing. You want to help them find the killer, right? So Right. But then at the same time, it turns out you're not the killer. And you're like, oh, man, they can't get closure. But hey, I'm not the killer. So that's good. But he seemed yeah. very caught up with justice. Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't him, or maybe it was him. He's not even sure. He just wants to help them. It's very strange to me. Yeah. We don't see he that He definitely a had a sense of, like, duty to help, yes. you know? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And there's got to be a lot of emotions going on. You're relieved it's not you, but you're disappointed that you can't give them answers. But then yes. also you're like, um, I guess I was in prison. What the hell happened right. there? You know? <laughs> and how did I forget that? <laughs> there's a lot. That's why I just chalked this one up to blackout drunks. That makes the most sense. Yeah. One man that police were actively searching for was a known transient, possibly named David Dye, who was seen talking to the boys before their disappearance. He had been camping in a cluster of trees near the railroad tracks in the area and was seen on August 28th and 29th before leaving on the morning of August 30th, and he was not seen again. They drew a composite sketch, and Dr. David Levine, a psychology professor at the University of Nebraska, created a psychological profile of the suspect. 
Dr. Levine believed that he may be a paranoid schizophrenic or a former mental patient who had spent significant time committed into a mental institution. And I'm not sure if this is just a little bit of bias on his part or if it's based on something concrete, especially I think that we have to put the caveat in there that this is a long time ago. It's like satanic panic or whatnot. It's sometimes easy to point in one direction at a vulnerable population or choose something to villainize. That's my take on it. But I don't know. What do you think, Court? I agree. I feel like they're kind of in the beginning stages of really doing psychological profiles as well. And so it is very similar to the satanic panic of the 80s and things like that as well, where they're just so, you know, like caught up in taking strange parts and putting them together and making it like oh we caught him look he really was he was a teacher who also did this who did that and they get so proud of themselves it feels like this got away from them i feel like the profile was maybe like you said in its infancy of doing psychological profiles so there's something to grasp onto there but i don't know how great if we look back at some of the psychological profiles in the 70s I don't know how great they were. I would be curious to see how often the profiles matched the actual convicted person. A hundred percent. And then also, they're, they're just so, like, the person that they are profiling here is definitely, it just doesn't make sense with what they're finding, like, to me. It just... Maybe, you know, because hindsight's twenty twenty, but the person they're looking for, it just doesn't, it doesn't all go together. You, how do you have somebody who, you know, like they said, the man was a drifter who had never held a job for long. He has religious delusions, correct? Um, but then at the same time, like he's very high average intelligence with more than a high school diploma. So how is he somebody who's not holding a job? You know, it's like the things don't really go together when I right. was look. This is my opinion when I was looking at it. So it just kind of seemed like this is new. I- I'm not sure. I'm sure Dr. <laughs> Levine did did many, but hindsight's twenty twenty. I think is what's really going on here. It just doesn't seem like the person you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, his profile indicated some mental health issues, said that he had been committed. It also said that he was of above average intelligence, that he's a drifter, that he has religious delusions, all these sorts of things. But I also just think this is a way of villainizing mental health issues and stigmatizing anyone that was outside the norm of certain mental health boundaries, you know? Yeah. I don't know if I'm making complete sense, but things are not completely normalized. People don't want to talk even today about going to therapy or being on medication. There's still a lot of stigma. But back then, we're talking about the 70s, any sort of deviation from quote unquote normal brain function, emotional function, etc., is just bad. And I think this is a case where it's just everything is villainized, you know. Yeah. Oh, he's paranoid schizophrenic. He's a, a drifter. He's this, that, and the other thing. And some of these things ring true to what William is. But also, I think it's just easy to say, oh, yeah, he's got to have these mental issues because that's what we think at this time. Anybody that's got mental issues is violent. Yeah, it's, you see also, like you're saying, you know, at this period of time, that anybody who has mental issues is paranoid schizophrenia. Yes. At this yeah. period, of, in these 70s, in these 70s <laughs> profiles, they're all paranoid schizophrenics who are yeah, probably not on medication. common diagnosis. Or were at some point on medication and now aren't. It's like, um, okay. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> It's interesting. So anyway, that's our TED Talk on why profiling is wrong. People are going to be pissed. <laughs> People are going to be pissed at us for this, but 
No, I anyway. think that we've we've come a long way and there's again exactly. like we know now CT scans exist, MRIs exist. There's a lot more, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy has come a long way. There's a lot more psychiatry being used. I mean, these medicines and technologies have advanced so much since then. So I just, you know, think it's important to point out that this person was probably doing their best given what they knew at the time. But this doctor doesn't have the kind of information that we have today. And so when they lacked information, that's when people would go to things like villainizing and demonizing mental health, or satanic panic, or, you know, being against metal music and explicit lyrics or video games or whatever it was of the time. This is, I think, what that profile suggests is just villainizing what was a problem in society to them at the time. Yes. That's my take on it. I like your take. I agree. (laughs) In June of 1976, police were searching the campfire area near the woods where their still missing suspect had been camping when they found a letter opener, which they believed was the murder weapon. Both those kids were stabbed to death. Correct. So they think they found it. The handle had an image of a woman graduate dressed in a cap and gown carved into it and was concluded that it was an antique from 1916. So very rare. Police released pictures of the unusual item, hoping that someone would recognize it, but nobody contacted them about it. This seems like something that's a one-off that was handmade. You know, you would think that someone would be like, oh, I I know that. I've seen that before. Exactly. This seems It was like very surprising. This seems like something that somebody who is maybe a prowler or like a low-key burglar who just grabs purses or, you know, people leave their door open a lot, like back, at, especially this time, get air through the house right in the Midwest and stuff, storm, all that stuff. So it wouldn't even surprise me if he's just... In one of these towns and just hops off a train, takes the uh, opportunity and maybe climbs through a window, goes right through a front door, grabs a purse, steals a weapon off a table that, you know, it's a letter opener. He doesn't know what it is and just takes off. And it's like one of those. Maybe he just picked it up random at a train station, but it's definitely something someone would remember, especially the class of 1916. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But yeah, it's a weird one. And to me, I just, this is a personal item from someone. Absolutely. It's very personal. I feel like this is something that someone had made or was a gift or something. And I'm really surprised that when they released the picture, nobody came forward. Same. One year after the murders, the media and police attempted to renew interest in the murders and hopefully kind of inspire new witnesses to come forward by putting out a newspaper article updating the status of the case. Police posted signs at the 1976 fair with pictures of both boys, composites of the suspect, pictures of the unique letter opener, and any pertinent information basically hoping to just jog someone's memory about the fair the year before. In August of 1976, during this period of time of increased focus on the case, William was actually questioned about the boy's deaths. He was given a polygraph, and then he was released. With Metro by T-Mobile, your hard-earned money goes further. This tax season, there's zero fees to switch. Enjoy Metro's lowest price, just 25 bucks a line for four lines. Plus, get four free Samsung Galaxy phones when you switch. Now that's the best deal in wireless. Metro by T-Mobile, empowering you to rule your day. All lines lose promo rate if any deactivates. No fees on select phones. Limit one per line with eligible port. Excludes sales tax. Limited time offer. Additional terms apply. See Metro by T-Mobile.com. 
With Metro by T-Mobile, your hard-earned money goes further. This tax season, there's zero fees to switch. Enjoy Metro's lowest price. Just 25 bucks a line for four lines. Plus, get four free Samsung Galaxy phones when you switch. Now that's the best deal in wireless. Metro by T-Mobile, empowering you to rule your day. All lines lose promo rate if any deactivates. No fees on select phones. Limit one per line with eligible port. Exclude sales tax. Limited time offer. Additional terms apply. See Metro by T-Mobile.com. Investigators also tried to find connections to similar cases in other states, specifically where abduction of young boys for sexual abuse purposes was the motive. Friends and relatives said William was, quote, not that type of person to be accused of murder. That's what they always say. Always. The wife of his cousin Elmer said, quote, It just didn't sound like Junior, unless he was a different type of person away than he was here. He would entertain the kids with different sounds, freight train sounds, any animal you could think of. He's so good with kids, Brianna. I don't know what your problem is. Again, that's the only thing people have to say about him. (laughs) It's so creepy. This is the biggest red flag. And then the other thing, again... I asked you earlier, how many times have you been questioned in a murder case? Right. Right. (laughs) And not only questioned, but brought in as one of the prime suspects. I mean, what? You know, just the fact that you're questioned. And And this is happening to you multiple times. Yeah. There's an issue. And you're on the move all the time and they're able to nail you down for an interview? Hmm. Interesting. He loves kids. Did we tell you that? (laughs) Loves them. Something hinky's going on there. He's got that train whistle mouth. I wonder (laughs) if he's missing a lot of teeth and that helps him with the freight train whistle. Oh, God. I didn't even think of that until just now. Yep. Hmm. That would make sense. My mind wanders. Despite what people who knew him thought, There were detectives in several states who were trying to solve cases for crimes that he had committed or were trying to find him because he was the main suspect for a crime. Investigators from three different states were having a hard time making cases that would stick to William since, of course, at the time there was, you know, no surveillance videos, cell phone pinging, any of the technology that would often help crack the cases nowadays, especially for someone who's moving around so much. You know, nowadays, even if someone's on the railroad, we can see where their cell phone was, we can see when they were online somewhere. But at this time, he was just a ghost, you know, so it was impossible to see where he was. But prosecutors in Lincoln, Nebraska, actually had enough evidence to get an arrest warrant for the kidnapping and murder cases of Jacob Sherber and John Simpson. Detectives from Lincoln and Omaha, Nebraska, Rock Island, Normal and Springfield, Illinois, Fort Mason, Iowa, Topeka and Otto, Kansas, Chandler, Arizona, and Santa Ana, California, who all of them didn't have as much evidence, basically decided to work together to gather evidence to strengthen the cases for the murders of Jacob and John. So there were all these other cities that had just little tidbits, but not enough for an arrest warrant, and they all decided to chip in and try and help. I have a feeling he was a little bit more of a pain in the ass than we are led to believe by all these glowing statements about his train whistle mouth. And (laughs) it seems like they were so willing, right? That they must have had little tiny things on him leading up for years. Like each, each police station, you know, because they're all train towns. They all are the same place, just in different states. And so it seems to me just the police were so willing to help each other. This does not happen a lot tells me especially this time 
tells me they all, they knew they just had to work together to get their hands on him. Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody knew it was him. They just needed to nail down where he was, when he was there, get a timeline together and pull all their information and cases so that they could get something to convict him on. That was the impossible thing, especially since not only was he constantly traveling and on the move, but we didn't have the type of forensics. We didn't have the technology. There was just so many things against this case being solved. So they had to pool their knowledge and the resources to get something together to scrape together a case. Although law enforcement now knew who they were looking for, finding William was difficult since he'd used so many aliases throughout the years and he was often on the move. It's just nearly impossible to nail someone down that's like that. Detectives caught a lucky break when he was found and arrested in Springfield, Illinois, outside the Illinois State Fair, while he was sleeping in a broken down bus that he'd been living in. Just follow the fares and you'll find him. Exactly. And that's clearly what they were doing. (laughs) Yeah. When she heard of the news of the arrest, Mrs. Serber said, We miss Jake very much. The Lord just upholds us and we just keep going. She said she, quote, had no hard feelings toward William and that it's just too bad he's been running alone so long. And it's also too bad if he did those things he's accused of doing. Just the most non-emotional statement it seems very i want to say maybe generous or light you know you you hear parents reacting to their child's murderer being found and it's just racked with revenge and anger and i don't know if i'd be capable of being that calm about it you know i think if i was in that position i would be pretty livid and angry and just spewing some pretty hateful things because that's my child. We would not be able to control ourselves. I don't really relate to where she's coming from just being so calm like that. I have a feeling that this is old school religious stoicism coming from a woman from the Midwest who has probably been working her whole life raising a million children. And it's just, you know what I mean? Like that strong religious woman that we all have, like our great grandmas, you know? That yeah, or she they, can't really publicly let her emotions out. She cannot let out. you know how she feels. No, absolutely yeah. not. And she would probably be considered like a hysterical woman, Right. If she did show emotion. So therefore, we don't show emotion and we go with God, basically. (laughs) Is what this is. It's just, I have no feelings about this. I gave it to the Lord because I can't even function thinking about it. So therefore, we give it to God and we just compartmentalize. That It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It is definitely the role of the woman to stay extremely calm, even in situations like this. And not show anything that's going on in your heart or your mind so I I get that that's I'm probably being a little bit judgmental but I just can't imagine having to suppress that and not freaking out when talking to the media about my son who's passed you know I just can't imagine it's a different time yeah that's what I have to remind myself of all the time Mm mm-hmm William was arraigned on August 22nd, 1979 in Lincoln, Nebraska, on two counts of kidnapping and first-degree murder in the deaths of Jacob Serber and John Simpson. Although it was possible to come to a plea agreement, William chose not to enter a plea. 
Investigators from other towns with unsolved cases believe that William is responsible for more murders, possibly close to 15 between the years of 1975 and 1979. Yeah, somewhere between 5 and 15 murders. Yeah. And that's a short amount of time, too. Yeah, very short. Which means there's more. Yeah. Since they finally had him in custody after a difficult search, detectives from across the U.S. were frantically trying to put cases together and see if they had enough evidence to charge William with other crimes. On May 20th, 1979, a 12-year-old boy named Jack Hanrahan had gone missing from a local bowling alley. His nude body was found 10 days later in the Dragoon Creek bed. He was dead with massive injuries to his chest, as well as strangulation marks. Topeka was able to make a case for the murder of Jack Hanrahan, and William was charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, and sodomy. William tried to tell detectives that he had been in the VA hospital at the time of the Topeka murder, but they did not believe him. Of course, you know, if you wanted to get out of a murder, you would say that you were somewhere else. So, of course, they didn't believe him. I was asleep at the time. Right. In 1980, prison psychiatrists noticed that William had been showing signs of paranoia and they questioned whether he was mentally capable to stand trial. Now, we've come a very long way because by 1980, we know that MRIs are also now three years old because those came out in 77. So we're definitely making huge strides. So now people are starting to look at him and go, wait, you took a giant shot to the head in the 40s in World War II? Yeah, you might be affected by this. And they're really starting to look at him going, Maybe he's not eccentric. Maybe he has mental like disturbances going on that have just been, oh, freight train, making whistles. Kids love him. Yeah, they've just been dismissing it and not treating it. Yep. And again, like we always say, there's plenty of people that have traumatic brain injuries that don't commit violence that, you know, are able to get treatment, get help. And I know even at this time when there wasn't much treatment or help for people, there's so many people that had injuries that didn't do anything violent. So it's important to point that out. There's definitely not a correlation of just TBI equals murder. But this person... (laughs) Oh my God, I'm sorry. (laughs) On a t-shirt. (laughs) <laughs> but this person, obviously, it affected them to the point where they couldn't control those urges or they chose not to or they chose to live a life of violence or whatever the case may be. I think the violence is a choice. The traumatic brain injury is something that you live with and you have to work on and overcome and whatnot. But he made the choice to be violent and victimize people. There's a difference. We're also forgetting a big part to this, which is his brain is pickled. Like he's an alcoholic, like hardcore alcohol is going on top of all this too. So any yeah, sort on top of, logic of the trauma. And, yeah, any sort of logic and reason or, you know, let's say that his brain is healing at some point. Well, everything he does just completely obliterates all the hard work. Right. Yeah. Yeah, And even then, there's plenty of alcoholics with brain injuries and whatever that still wouldn't do this. But, you know, it's just part of his individual story. That's part of what makes him who he is. But he chose the route of violence. That is definitely a choice. So since the psychiatrist had really had some extreme concerns about his competency, they began holding pretrial hearings to determine if he was fit to stand trial. Psychiatrists testified that William had an IQ of 69, irreparable brain damage from chronic alcoholism, 
poor nutrition, and years of hard living. When his outbursts towards the staff were brought up, William yelled, quote, The staff gets on me, and that's why I get on the staff. Do whatever you want to do. Send me to the chair or do whatever you want. I don't care. Sadly, the charges pending against William for Jacob and John's murders were dropped because the judge ruled statements he made to police had to be suppressed. That really blows my mind. Yes. It really, after all the, oh my God, all this police work, this, you know, putting it all together and, well, oh, just all of it. Yeah, it's extremely frustrating when you feel like the system fails. And it's on both sides in my mind, you know, when anyone's held in prison and then it's determined that they were actually innocent or when someone, you know, committed a murder just goes out and roams free and they can't convict them. It just really doesn't make any sense. It's hard to wrap my brain around. It makes me sad for the families, for the victims, and it's just unbelievable when something like that happens. Shortly after, the Topeka DA dropped its charges because it was proven that William indeed checked into an Illinois detox center at the time of Jack Hanrahan's murder. So that one we know he actually didn't do and his alibi was true and i just can't believe that two times in the same case we're talking about people that were not sure where they were when a murder was committed yeah yeah wild in february of 1980 william was ruled unable to care for himself and he was committed to a mental institution and it's crazy that he's just been wandering around for like 40 years where technically he has been this entire time unable to care for himself and should have been committed right it's not like just today he woke up and they're like oh hey you're uh not doing so hot he's been this way the whole time (laughs) and it's like they just chalked it up to oh he's just that homeless dude on the train you know oh just a little different he's if he was rich they would call him eccentric you know And it's like, people are literally, they're out there. You're walking right past them every day. People that should be 5150 right now. It's just bizarre to me. But it's the truth. This is real life. He needed the help this whole time. Like you said, for 40 years, he needed the help. He needed to get psychiatric care and treatment and therapy and he didn't have it. Instead, he was just on the streets, on the railroad tracks, crossing the U.S., being in every state. And that's scary and sad. Yeah, it is. Once William was in the hospital, more assessment and treatment began. He was diagnosed with chronic alcoholism, and it was determined that he was suffering from organic brain syndrome. In 1981, a public defender named Dennis Keefe called for a reopening of the case and accused the police of, quote, sloppy investigative work. Okay, listen, this guy's a really good attorney, but I also don't like what he is saying about the police because they really did do a good job because of, as we know here, linkage blindness. You know, there's different... Uh, precincts. They don't talk to each other. They want to keep their info close to the vest. They want to be the one to crack the case so they won't share info. And these guys really came together and shared info. And yeah, maybe they did ask a couple questions or forgot to maybe say, hey, here's your rights (laughs) first. But they really, it's not sloppy. You know, it was... It doesn't really sound like that's the case. It sounds like this is just a lawyer that wants to get his client off. And that's the lawyer's job. That's what I think. He's a good attorney. But it's kind of bullshit, you know? Anyway, I don't know why it really bothered me on this one, but it did. Because they really did come together. 
And there's some defense attorneys and, you know, especially we talk about people that work for the Innocence Project or something like that. That's understandable. But when someone is not held accountable yes. for many crimes that we know they committed, but there's not enough evidence in 15 crimes, you know, but we know that that person was the prime suspect. I mean, it just seems like he's doing what an attorney does and trying to kind of weasel his client's way out of being held accountable. You know, think, that's his I job. You, I you get hit it. this on the head. Yeah. But it, it's really a, a smarmy thing to do. You know? Smarmy. Exactly. Keefe said that William's confessions were useless since they were after little sleep and immediately after he'd been intoxicated for an estimated eight days straight. To show you how easy it is to file a claim with GEICO, we hired fitness celebrity Billy Blanks. Okay, everybody, our car just got a broken windshield. How about we blow off some steam? Now punch, now kick. Uh, Mr. Blanks, there's no need to be stressed. GEICO makes it easy to file a claim online, on the app, or over the phone. Yeah, but what if I never hear back? That's going to make me want to go jab and jab. Uh, nope. Your GEICO claims team is always there for you. Okay, do I still get my post-workout protein shake? Sure, Billy. GEICO, great service without all the drama. With Metro by T-Mobile, your hard-earned money goes further. This tax season, there's zero fees to switch. Enjoy Metro's lowest price. Just 25 bucks a line for four lines. Plus, get four free Samsung Galaxy phones when you switch. Now that's the best deal in wireless. Metro by T-Mobile. Empowering you to rule your day. All lines lose promo rate if any deactivates. No fees on select phones. Limit one per line with eligible port. Excludes sales tax. Limited time offer. Additional terms apply. See Metro by T-Mobile.com. Keefe became a champion for William's rights since William was not actually convicted of anything, but was simply being held for his own protection. He said that William had been railroaded, uh -huh, uh -huh, puns, uh -huh. by the media who had falsely connected him to multiple cases of missing boys. All the preconceived notions were unavoidable because police had been constantly connecting with other jurisdictions and naming William as a possible suspect in so many cases. His attorney, Dennis Keefe, was also consistently trying to get William moved from maximum security facilities to minimum security. He believed these facilities would be suitable for William's needs since he hadn't been convicted of any violence and he simply needed medical care. And this is chicken or the egg because he would have been convicted were he not so in need of mental assistance, but he's in need of mental assistance. You know, it's like, I mean, come on. Yeah, it just definitely seems like a loophole that he's in. You it's know? exactly what it is. When William was given a pass to go on an outing with his lawyer, he instead chose to go to the Lincoln Fairgrounds to visit his old Carney friends. It's what's comfortable. Yep. Yep. Despite this, Dennis succeeded in having William transferred to a lower security facility, and he was moved there in 1981. In December of 1981, William walked out of the Milwaukee facility that he was in and was later found in the nearby railroad yard just wandering around the tracks and in the boxcars. On July 13, 1982, 60-year-old William was being housed in a Milwaukee nursing home when he once again walked out of the facility. The administrator of the home was on William's trail because they remembered, of course, his history of checking into various VA hospitals whenever he didn't have a home and he was out on the streets. So the administrator began calling around and... Sure enough, William had checked himself into the Toma, Wisconsin VA hospital on July 15th, but he had checked out on July 20th, 1982. 
On August 3rd, in Rapid City, South Dakota, several people told an officer about a hitchhiker on Highway 79 who they noticed behaving strangely. When the cop arrived and ran the man's information, he saw that William was wanted for the murder of two boys. So, of course, he took him into the station. I mean, it's crazy that he's still, they're still able to look up and see, like, two a murder warrant of two little boys that, you know, from decades prior that is still active. So then how come you're in minimum faci- security facilities? And right. it's only because he technically isn't fit to stand trial. But you still have to be held accountable. So then what we do is we put you in a maximum facility and you don't just walk out and do whatever you want. <laughs> But thank you, Dennis. I can't Keith. believe he's out on the street. It's insane. The fact that they were able to see that on his record still, that it wasn't taken out of the system. Or, you know, this is something that our last episode is it's called a computer glitch, right? That right. like, oh, we looked it up and yeah, he was still one. It's like, wait, if this is still there, then how is the, how are they sleeping at night letting him be in a minimum facility? You know, it's just lawyers. That's what this is. Right. It's just kind of getting those loopholes in the system. Yep. So shortly after they arrived at the station, when they ran his information and found this out, they started digging more and they determined that the charges were not current and that he indeed was not wanted for murder. Because he wasn't actively wanted for that crime, he technically couldn't be extradited to Nebraska. But as an agreement with South Dakota police, he voluntarily put himself into the South Dakota VA hospital. How often do you hear about police negotiating where you like what you want to do because they know their hands are tied? And if he just turns around and walks out, they can't do anything about it. So I feel like they maybe did some sort of strong arming or, you know, they must have made something nice for him or whatever it is because he agreed. But he's also very comfortable in the VA. So, you know, it it was probably not a big deal to him to just be like, oh, yeah, I'll go. I'll get a free trip to the VA. You know, Mm -hmm. that's his comfort zone. Yes. So bizarre. After only three months in the VA hospital, he walked out again. And he was just in the wind once more. On May 4th, 1983, a minister in Valley Falls, Kansas, saw William leaving the church. And when he checked the collection bowl, he found $8 was missing. He called the police who found him and arrested him for the theft of the church's money. When the minister, of course, ID'd the man that he had seen. He also received a weapons charge for having a sharpened railroad spike in his pocket at the time of the arrest. This is another reason why I do believe that he was a burglar and a prowler, and he would just kind of sneak into an unoccupied area, take what he could, and disappear. Because this is $8 from a church. Yeah, it's nothing and just a crime of opportunity. That's it. For this offense, he was given another hospital term in lieu of jail time. On April 4th, 1997, William died in a state mental hospital in eastern Kansas. There are at least 16 young boys that went missing from 1972 to 1979, with ages ranging from 7 to 14 across the Mid and Southwest that basically armchair investigators and police officers alike believe that William may have killed. Each of these cases involve the victims being found near railroad switches or tracks and also within the timing of some kind of state or county fair or carnival that just ended in the closest town. So it's not just railroad murders in general. It's looking at something near the train tracks and the fairs because they know that that overlap means William Guatney. 
there's a few there's like a triangle of power here you know there's like certain things that all come together when it comes to him the springfield illinois state fair is mentioned several times you'll recall this is the town that joan let him stay in the garage of her home sometimes one of the most common cases connected to William is the murder of Joseph Spizak, who went missing from Hammond, Indiana, on January 27, 1974. Joseph was seen near the railroad tracks the day he went missing, and many speculate that he could have been pulled into a train car by William. They speculate that if he was in the train car, he could have been raped, murdered, and then discarded anywhere along that rural train track routes. It's speculated that this is why Joseph was never found. His family will not rule him legally dead, as police have tried to convince them to do, because they still hold out hope that maybe just one day Joseph will return home. Sad. So sad. William has also been suspected in the case of 13-year-old Richard Grenier, who disappeared after going sledding four blocks from his home around 4 p.m. on January 17, 1972, in Pekin, Illinois. To get to the sledding park, Richard had to cross a railroad switch on the way there and back. His friends saw him at 5.30 p.m. pulling a blue sled up a hill in his easily recognizable gold jacket. But after that, he was never seen again. One of the boys who William had actually confessed to killing was abducted only 200 yards from where Richard had last been seen by his friends. That is too much of a coincidence for me. No evidence of Richard has ever been found, not even the sled or the jacket. Lincoln police also believe that William was the kidnapper and murderer of 11-year-old Jay Durnhill of Omaha, Nebraska. Nine-year-old Mark Helmig lived across from a railroad track and was found dead inside a railroad boxcar in East Peoria, Illinois, in 1976. The 4-H fair was at the ground just beyond the tracks, and local law enforcement has always looked at William as the prime suspect in this murder. The same goes for 14-year-old Marty Lancaster of Normal, Illinois, who went missing on June 11, 1978, and was later found dead on July 14 near the railroad tracks. An officer stated that William admitted to being in Normal and seeing Marty on June 11, the day he disappeared. I can't believe he admitted to seeing the kid the same day. Like, it's, that is, you're too close. William, what are you doing? I mean, obviously, he's going to be fine. But the criminal mind, it's like, too close, back up. What are you doing? What are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that one just doesn't make sense why he would admit to that. No. But I think after all this, he must think he's invincible. Yes, The Corn Belt Horse Show was finishing up a three-day run in town at the time of Marty's disappearance. There are at least 10 other cases William is suspected of being involved with. An eight-year-old, Jeffrey Honner's skeletal remains were found after he had gone missing from a swimming pool in Ottawa on May 20th, 1979. He was found by a crew digging a ditch and was identified by his clothing. Back at the time that these murders were happening, Harding and Edna Simpson, who were victim John Simpson's parents, said that they were living in fear for their safety of their children. 
they had 11-year-old twins, Dennis and Denise, and a 21-year-old daughter, Lois. The two younger ones were not allowed to go anywhere without a parent, and their older daughter, Lois, actually moved back into their family home after John's murder. Lois was terrified of going to or answering the back door of their house at night because she was convinced that someone would snatch her in the dark. In 1997, a man named Thomas Berberich confessed to an Asajj County jail counselor that back in 1989, he had murdered Jack Hanrahan in Topeka, Kansas. Thomas also told another prisoner in the day room named Lewis Holden that he had killed Jack, sexually mutilated him, and had known Jack's mother. Nine years later, Thomas was finally taken to trial. During the trial, then-victim Jack's first cousin, Cindy, testified because she had a daughter with Thomas Berberich. She recalled that Thomas came home very angry on May 12, 1979, because he wasn't invited to his daughter's birthday party and told her that she was going to pay and, quote, not to be surprised if you find someone in the river with cement boots on. Jack disappeared eight days later. Thomas was acquitted of Jack's murder And William was never convicted, so Jack Hanrahan's murder is still unsolved. That is a super bizarre twist to me, too. The whole the murder of Jack Hanrahan in general is its own episode. Like, it's just crazy that there's all this family infighting and then the baby daddy boyfriend's cousin's mother's daughter is. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's just like, yeah, the connection there. Jack. Yeah. And then. For them to think he did it and then he did it and then to find out like technically Jack is still unsolved, you know, when most people believe Thomas is the one that he did that shit, but they just couldn't convict him. But um, I just really wanted to make sure that we pointed out that William was not convicted of Jack Hanrahan's murder. Technically, William wasn't convicted of shit, but it's a good journey to go through. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like they couldn't hold him accountable for anything. I mean, they just kept getting all these leads and having him as a suspect, but they didn't have enough. And I know that, like we said, forensic science wasn't up to the level that it was now. You know, we didn't have the technology to track him. There was a lot of things at play here that worked against the detectives and worked against the ability to put the cases together. But William is the prime suspect in so many of these murders. And there's something to be said for, like you said, most people have never been looked at as a suspect for anything. You know, the fact that over and over again, people think he's the only one that was in the area or that has this MO or whatnot. I mean, there's something going on there. He definitely committed more crimes than we know of. Yeah, definitely. That's a fact. And he's just never held accountable for any of it. Because he just goes to VA hospitals and then they just say, oh, he's not mentally even fit for, you know, anything. And I mean, everyone knew there was an issue, but they just figured, oh, we'll just put him back in the VA. They'll take care of it. And so he just gets pushed along every time. He really slips through the cracks in every sense, you know? I I I do think there is a part of that. Part of the reason is because of the fact that he does have this, you know, this low IQ and he doesn't really, you know, it's not like he has some stable job, you know, he's a, he's a person like kind of what you would quote unquote, like an undesirable and not in my backyard. So it's like, we just push him along. It's a, it's a close and mental illness at the time too. was, you know, he just swept under the rug. It's a secret. We just lock him away somewhere. And that's what they did to him. And then he would just get out. <laughs> he would just walk out of a facility. 
Yeah, it's unbelievable to me that he was still on the street after possibly committing so many crimes. Yeah. Yeah. And also, the fact that they did connect him. Like, they identified and connected the dots and were sure that he was this David Die that they were looking for. That that little campsite that they found that this transient David Die had been staying, that's where William Guatney had been staying. Right. So that's it's like, who he was. Come on. And then I did. That's I an mean, alias. There, exactly. There is a book that was written that's called Slayer of Innocence by Jim Conover. And there's a, a documentary on like YouTube or, or no, I think it's Amazon Prime that's called Freight Train Slayer of Innocence. And it's all from a very, you know, standpoint that he is guilty. He killed all these people. And I don't because of the fact that Jack Hanrahan, there's still questions even later that it possibly wasn't him. I didn't necessarily take these with all the grains of salt but their stance is he did it all he's guilty if you're interested in looking into that and all the articles if you want to read more on this like we always say those links are in our show notes every week so if you want to read more then definitely check those out there's more information but i mean this is definitely an overview and a good collection of all the information that's out there. But if you want to go into like a worm time about it, definitely Reddit or any of these articles. There's a lot out there. There's a lot on Reddit of people like the armchair investigators laying out the case and why they believe, you know, this one, this is what happened regarding this one. And it's a very good timeline. You know, the Redditors, they've done our work. It's great. <laughs> I love it. I love Reddit so much, man. Oh, it's so good. Um, but yeah, this one is very interesting. And the funniest thing, too, is the picture that comes up with this guy. There's just no better picture of a railroad killer than someone wearing <laughs> an engineer's cap in every picture you find of him. It's so funny to me. <laughs> he looked like he would be a conductor at a mall train. Yeah, hundred percent. That's a blue and white hat. I mean, you know the guy. Like, I'm telling you, this picture is so good. So anyway, yeah, railroad. It's really easy to just become a ghost. Yep, railroad letter R. That's why it's a perfect, perfect subject for letter R. Yeah, that's a commonality for sure. Next week we're going to go to an international railroad killer. Ooh, overseas. Very exciting. Stuff. That'll be that'll be interesting because, I mean, we have so many U.S. railroad killers. Oh, it's and ridiculous. I'm definitely interested in seeing what's going on somewhere else. You know, we'll be traveling to Marseille, France. It'll be very exciting. Well, before we get out of here, yeah, thank you for listening. Like I said, if you want to check out uh, more information about the case that we covered tonight always check out the links in our show notes. If you need some resources for mental health and other support, there's the links in our show notes. If you want merch, there's Threadless and our Patreon is linked in the show notes, patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast. And the last thing before we get out of here, we just want to say thank you to the new people on our Patreon who are Haley, Lana, Casey, Jess, Celeste, Shell, and Aloha La Candy, a.k.a. Candice. Thank you. So thanks, you guys. We really appreciate you so much for being on our Patreon. And that's pretty much it from us. Um, We will be back next time with an international letter R railroad killer. Can't wait. So have a great week. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. Wear a mask. And we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye.
For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. With Metro by T-Mobile, your hard-earned money goes further. This tax season, there's zero fees to switch. Enjoy Metro's lowest price. Just 25 bucks a line for four lines. Plus, get four free Samsung Galaxy phones when you switch. Now that's the best deal in wireless. Metro by T-Mobile, empowering you to rule your day. All lines lose promo rate if any deactivates. No fees on select phones. Limit one per line with eligible port. Excludes sales tax. Limited time offer. Additional terms apply. See MetroByTMobile.com.